Hey guys, hope you had a great break. I'm going to work you through chapter 13, just a few of the really important ideas that I think you need to know. So here we go. One of the first major issues when you're dealing with the Middle Ages is what were the dates and what do you call it? First of all, for this chapter, we're only going to deal with the time period between the fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance or Reformation period. So that's generally about the 6th through the 11th centuries. One of the questions you have also is what do you call this? Do you call it the Dark Ages? Do you call it the Middle Ages? Scholars have really struggled with this because if you call it the Dark Ages it tends to make people believe that there's nothing really going on uh, there was a complete loss of learning. However, one theologian has described it, described this period as a time of superstition uh, where life was short, nasty, and brutish. Now, that is true. Life was really tough. They ran around in um, wool underwear, and it was cold. They had famine. They had war. So life was pretty rough. Another term used is the Middle Ages, and that kind of says, well, there's this great age of the Roman Empire and then there's this great modern age and this just happened in the middle but the reality is a little bit different think about the best year of your life or maybe the worst year of your life um, was it the best year of the life for everybody or was it the worst year of the life for everybody of course not so there are high points and low points throughout every period so calling it the dark ages is pretty inaccurate uh, there were, were some really high points during this time period so we'll look at that first let's look at the structure the social structure of what was going on at the time this was a time of the feudal system and in this system you have the Roman Empire is crumbling so you have no real centralized government it's moved back to most of an mostly an agrarian culture uh, generally what you're going to be doing if you are a person of the Middle Ages you're going to either be a noble person that owns land or you're going to be um, a peasant who works the land. Now because there's no centralized government there's a division of the territory into really small areas and over these small areas you have these feudal overlords who are in charge of that land and so because of this structure of these small pockets of um, areas where there are these rulers there's kind of a hierarchical structure where the landowner really has a bond toward the peasants the the folks who live under him and the folks who live under that overlord certainly have a loyalty to the overlord above them and a dependency upon them there's really a dependency upon each but as we move into the modern period as we'll see there's less of a dependency by the uh, serfs or the the peasants there's really no upward mobility during this time period you're not going to marry a prince if you're a young poor peasant girl no matter how good-looking you are it's just not Disney World or Disneyland a story like that during the medieval period if a noble person saw a young lady who was attractive he wouldn't make her his wife but he would uh, make her his uh, girlfriend and there wasn't a lot of weren't a lot of options there there is something that in this period that is hard for us to understand in it, that it is a communal way of life everybody is connected for example if in your the area where you live you're tied or connected to the folks who are the bakers or the blacksmith or uh, the farmers and so if you've got a bad farmer or a bad baker or a bad blacksmith your stuff is going to be uh, poor quality you're not going to go to Walmart and buy something that's created or made somewhere else so everybody knows everybody and there's some comfort in that when we get to the modern period we'll see that it seems kind of strange but there was comfort in knowing where your place was right you knew where you were going to sit when you went to church you knew where your social status was so there are many who felt comfortable in that they woke up in the morning and they knew that they were going to uh, work the fields or uh, 
uh, bake bread or uh, do some sort of uh, manual labor, and that's all they were ever going to do. They were really bound to tradition, and that was enforced by the church and also by the feudal overlords, that there's a way of doing things and change is bad, because change is is really trying to, when you're trying to change things, you're trying to overthrow the way that God has ordained this world. God has ordained it for leaders to be under over um, those who live on the land. And to seek change or to seek to break tradition in this period is actually a way of, of saying that you don't really like how God set things up. So uh, it's really an attack on God. Something here that we don't have in our current culture is that all is sacred. There's a sacredness of all life. There's no sacred and secular. There's no separation of church and state. And you'll read about Christendom in the next chapter. But there's really no separation between the religious life and the regular life that folks have. In this chapter, there's a discussion of the development of monastic life, the evolution of the papacy or papacy, the formulation of the Holy Roman Empire, and a discussion of some theologians. So let's look real quickly at the monastic life. Persecution of Christians had ended, and so the question is, how do I give myself to God wholly? Um, you're not going to be killed for your faith, so what do you do? And many folks sought to uh, separate themselves from the world and try to achieve salvation through becoming holy and separate from the world. One of the monastics that was mentioned in this chapter actually wasn't in the early medieval period, but I think he's important. He's Antony of Egypt. He's important because he represents a certain type of monasticism, and this is a monastic who lives by himself out in the desert. And Antony of Egypt was one of the most uh, important and revered monastics of this type. Athanasius wrote a biography of him and he became very famous. He was born into a wealthy family but became convicted by those stories in the Gospels of Jesus demanding that the rich give up all their possessions to follow him. So he does that. One of the great stories about Antony of Egypt is a story about how this military commander of Egypt, now remember Antony was during the early period and not in the um, early medieval period, but there was a persecution in Egypt, and one of the military commanders was persecuting Christians. And Antony wrote to him and said, you really need to leave the Christians alone. God wants you to uh, back off and uh, quit persecuting them, or there might be some consequences there. Well, Belasius tears up the letter and throws it away, and he says, Antony's going to be my next victim. But before he could get to Antony, in fact, about five days later, he was riding along and his horse started thrashing around and, and uh, crashed and Belasius is thrown from his horse and uh, the horse bites him and within three days he's dead. And so this is one of those great stories about Antony of Egypt and his power. As a matter of fact, his power was widely known and although he tried to become a hermit out in the desert and stay away from everybody, because of his great healing powers, uh, folks would follow him all over Egypt trying to, to locate him, and then he would, because he cared about others, he would heal them. They would go back, tell everybody else where he was, and they would hunt him down, and he would have to uh, uh, perform healings on them as well. And so even though he tried to be a hermit, because he was such a holy person, because he was such a powerful person, uh, he did have many followers. Next is Pacomius. He organized life in monasteries that were out in the desert. So you have a wilderness. So you still have that separateness. They're out in the desert. However, they're living communally. They're not hermits. They're not living by themselves. And then the third type of monasticism is an urban monasticism represented by Basil of Caesarea. They live in the villages and that way uh, and in the towns and the cities. And that way, when there are poor in the cities, orphans in the cities, uh, Basil can, and, and those who live with him, can minister to those. 
So this is a type of monasticism that says, yes, we're going to separate ourselves from society, but we need to minister to the society just like Jesus did. Next, there's uh, the father of Western monasticism, who is John Cassian. He writes two important books that are primarily to tell others about how to become spiritual, and then the Institutes, which is his second book, about how to live in those types of communities. He has a really major emphasis on Western monasticism, and a lot of the Irish monks have this, from him, they gather this love of scholarship where they um, actually treasure the biblical texts and copy them and preserve them and treasure the writings of the early church fathers and copy them and preserve them. And so we have a lot of the early texts that are taken care of by these Irish uh, monks. But they also believe that you couldn't just stay locked up in a monastery, that you had to uh, go out into the world. So they would go out on these missionary activities where they would preach uh, the gospel. And so it really spread Christianity in the West through this kind of movement that was begun by John Cassian. Next, we have Benedict of Nursia, uh, or Nursia. He wrote The Rule of Monasteries, a really important book that's even used today in monasteries. He believed that a monk should take a vow of poverty, saying that he was, would not own anything, of chastity, that they wouldn't engage in sex, obedience, that they would be obedient to the order and obedient to the, the leaders of that monastery or order, and stability. This is kind of interesting. I met a Benedictine monk uh, several years ago, and he lives in, there's a Benedictine mo monastery in, I believe, Covington, Louisiana. And this vow of stability means that he's going to stay there the rest of his life and minister there. And generally, they pray eight times a day, and so his mission in life is to pray for those in the area in which he resides. And so unless the order moves him, he's there. They're not go he's not going to move around. He'll stay in Covington for the rest of his life. Again, the text emphasizes that the motto of the Benedictine monasteries is pray and work. So they pray eight times a day and do a lot of work that sustains the monastery. Now, as early on as 910, we have problems in the monasteries, and that's because they're being corrupted because of this feudal system. You probably read about in your chapter the idea of lay investiture, and according to this idea, um, the leaders will appoint bishops or abbots or church officials or priests. And so what happens is that the landowner will build a monastery on his land, but the landowner then appoints the leader of the monastery, appoints the priest in his parish. And because of that, a lot of times the priest or the abbot of the monastery feel more obligated to uh, serve the landowner than to serving the church. And so this causes a lot of corruption within the church. There's also that idea of simony where uh, persons can buy and sell church leadership positions, and that also corrupts the church. So, in, at Cluny, you have William the Pious who tries to reform monasticism, and he does this by uh, trying to overthrow this idea of lay investiture and simony. Also attacks the idea of concubinage. You read about that in the text as well and promoting celibacy within the monasteries. All right, good news. The Holy Roman Empire section is pretty weak in this chapter, and it really doesn't go in the depth that I would like, but I'm really not that interested in it myself, so we're going to skip that section. So let's go to the theologians of this particular period and the popes of this period. We'll take a look at the popes first. The text does an interesting job of showing how the church is changing through the medieval period by contrasting the early pope with the latter pope. And so the first pope of this period, 
happens to be called, uh, named Gregory the First, and he's a very devout follower of Christ. He is a servant. He's a monk. He wants to evangelize. He's also very uh, cordial to the to the Eastern Church, and so he's a super nice guy, right? He really cares about those within his flock and tries to bring about uh, good relations with the Eastern Church. And he's also very intent on evangelizing and preaching to the good news. Now, what's interesting here, at the beginning of this period, his style is to uh, refer to the Pope as the servant of the servants of God. And so we have this very Christ-like figure who says, my job is to be a servant and my job is to be uh, to reconcile these differences between the various churches. And so he, he's more of a minister or more pastoral in his role. Next, we have Gregory the Seventh. Interestingly, they're not, he doesn't have the same name as uh, Gregory the First. What happens early on in the history of popes is that there's a pope who's named Saturn and he really doesn't think that's an appropriate name for someone to lead the church or the name of a god so he changes his name and the popes after him will then change their names to popes that to adopt names of popes that they uh, admire so this obviously is a admirer of Gregory the first however he's very different in his role because the church is changing because of this feudal system and because of the problems with simony and uh, lay investiture. So he sees himself as the supreme judge under God alone in that he is in charge of determining who. He has the keys of the kingdom and he can ch is in charge of who will go to heaven and who uh, is excommunicated. And as a matter of fact, he does excommunicate Henry IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, because Henry IV wants to appoint his own bishops. And Gregory is trying to say, no, the church is in charge of determining who the bishops are. And so these are, uh, he has to really assert his leadership here and assert his own authority. And that's why the first Gregory is primarily focused on being a servant. And Gregory the seventh here is primarily focused on taking hold of the church and being in charge of the church because it's a church in crisis at this point. We're going to look now at a couple of the theologians from the Eastern tradition. Pseudo Dionysius. His real identity is unknown. We don't know a lot about him, but he's very famous in the early church. But I'm going to be honest with you, he wasn't that famous for me. I had my I was in my graduate work before I'd even heard of this guy. So he's not a major theologian of the church, but he was a major theologian of this period. Now, he's most famous for his via negativa approach, which says that all affirmations concerning God must be denied uh, because God is above and beyond all that we could understand. And so you can't say, I'm very smart, therefore God is the most smart. God knows everything. I can't be in one place, more than one place, but God can be everywhere. God is omnipotent, omnipresent. Uh, you can't compare God to anything positively because you're denigrating God. So what you would say is, I know I'm smart, but I'm not like God at all in that God knows everything. Now, it seems like a small distinction, but what, what's going on here during this period is there becomes a, a great separation between God and humans here because as the church continues to become more and more corrupt, many people feel that God is actually separating God's self from the church. Next is Simeon, the new theologian. He believes that every person can have a conscious mystical experience of God uh, through the Holy Spirit. And of course, of course, he's a forerunner of the charismatic movement, which we'll re read about later in the semester. So he believes everybody has the ability, everybody who's been baptized, has the ability to be connected to God, because again, God is seen as above and beyond us and far removed from us. But through this Holy Spirit, everybody can attain a, an experience with God. Next, we have the Western theologians. Um, we dealt with two, but I'm 
in the chapter, but I'm only going to deal with uh, one, and that's Anselm of Canterbury. It's really interesting how you see an interplay between the culture here and theology, especially in his understanding of the theory of the atonement. Now, what is the theory of the atonement? Good question, right? The theory of the atonement is a theory that describes how Jesus' death on the cross reconciles us to God. How does that work? Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but now we are somehow saved by that. And so the theory of atonement tries to explain that. And so what Elm Anselm does is he uses the feudal system to describe what's going on there. In the feudal system, if you dishonor your overlord, you have to pay a debt of satisfaction in order to restore that overlord's honor. And so that's what Jesus' death was doing. Our sin had dishonored God, and so this is a debt satisfaction. Uh, Jesus' death on the cross is providing satisfaction or restoring God's honor. So the reason the text is called Curtius Homo, which is why the God-man God was the one who was dishonored. So only so let's talk first of all about why Jesus had to be man, then we'll talk about why he had to be God. Because humans had offended God, then humans had to pay this debt of satisfaction back to God. So Jesus had to be human because he was paying back a debt that was incurred by humans. This kind of ties back into the Cappadocian fathers of what he did not assume he couldn't heal. Remember that discussion? But what he, we're talking about here is that humans had dishonored God, so a human must pay satisfaction for that dishonor, honoring of God. However, no one's perfect, and no one can live a perfect life of holiness, and that's why Jesus had to be God as well. So, he was human because he had to pay this debt of satisfaction back to God, but he was God because only God can live that holy life. Now your text also mentioned that Anselm developed the idea, uh, discussions, an argument for the existence of God. Those are, from my perspective, a little more philosophical and not so convincing, so I like to uh, just leave that to Anselm and also Thomas Aquinas and maybe your philosophy teacher. So, there are three key facts that the text points out. There's a lot of social and political turmoil due to the feudal system and the um, battle between the popes and the Holy Roman Emperor and the popes and the local oh, and the leadership of the church and the local overlords. However, monasteries were places where those who really wanted to become a Christian and attain holiness, they fled to these monasteries, and they really developed a strong theology, and they also preserved a lot of the earlier church writings and were places for uh, spiritual development. But as we see in the beginning there with, at the end there with Anselm, this idea of creating a proof for the existence of God. These theologians also believe that the human mind and human reason would be very helpful in formulating and systematizing theology. I hope this helps you understand the text a little bit more. Remember to review that video about the essay and use that as you go back through this chapter to try to identify those things that are outside the church, those social or political factors outside the church that make an impact on the church. Have a great rest of the week. Again, if you have any questions about the chapter or need to see me or have any questions about the essay, feel free to uh, come by and see me or shoot me an email. Take care.